Welcome. This is lecture number 11 in the second course on the life of David and the lessons that we can learn from him. And if you want to pause the DVD for a moment, if you haven't already done so, read 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. This chapter gives us one of the saddest moments perhaps in David's life. David is a good illustration to us. I gather you've learned that by, from, by now. And the ups and downs of the Christian life. We always strive to have a consistency in our, in our walk with the Lord, but the fact of the matter is that we human beings tend to be up and down a little bit in everything. And David is a, an example of that to us, and uh, his ups and downs are maybe higher and lower than we would ever want to be. But uh, we learn many lessons from David's high points and from his low points. And as I said, this, is definitely, this chapter is definitely one of those places in David's life where he reaches a, a low point, and it's a, a sad point for us. But we learn from it. As Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, it says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer and to suffer need. So let's review for a moment. David was called to leave the lowly plains of Bethlehem to be a part of the uh, king's palace, King Saul's palace. He went from tending sheep to be the conqueror of Goliath and the popular hero as a result of the popular hero of Israel. But Saul's favor for David soon changed to animosity, to enmity, and David had to flee to the hills where for months, even years, he became, a, uh, the, he became the man that the, the king chased after and pursued after, and he was really, the king thought of him as his enemy. As his enemy. <clears throat> Eventually, David's fortunes changed again, and he became the king of Israel. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, he was enabled to capture Jerusalem, the stronghold of Zion, and he called it the city of David. And after a flawed effort to do so, he was able to bring the ark up to Jerusalem, as it says in 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 15, with shouting and the voice of the trumpet. But now we see David fleeing Jerusalem and being separated from that holy ark, and once more it would seem a fugitive, humiliated, and uh, for sure in anguish. So from David we learn not to expect life to always be easy for those of us that are believers. We're pilgrims on a journey, and the journey isn't always an easy one. We're soldiers, and we're called to fight the good fight of faith. A few verses in Psalm 119 I want to bring your attention to. Verse 71 says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. Verse 75. And then in Psalm 34, 19, it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Acts 14, 22 says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. One of the uh, faulty things about modern-day Christianity, at least in North America, is that we have propagated to people, to inquirers into the faith, We've made it sound to them sometimes that the Christian faith is easy. Just come to Jesus and all your problems will be solved and life will be just wonderful. But that's not the testimony of Scripture, neither is it the testimony of the saints through the ages. So we should not think it strange that as believers we go through trials and tribulations and difficulties and struggles. But the first thing we need to remember about these, these trials is that we do learn something. And one of the things that we learn for sure in our difficulties and our trials is that God is faithful. And that's our first point today is that God is faithful. James chapter 1 says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. 
If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Affliction, trials, tribulations, difficulties were now David's portion again. 2 Samuel 15 verse 13 says, And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. And I want you to visualize with me for a moment. Picture the sad scene that is portrayed here. Uh, the threatened revolt that had been steadily growing, and, and David, as we mentioned last time, didn't do anything about this, as it seemed to be growing, and David watched it grow, it was now bursting over the, over the king's head. By this time, David was about 60 years old, and his health and his strength might, may have been fading somewhat. We know that he only lived to be about 70. Ahithophel, his trusted counselor, had deserted him. And Absalom, his favorite son, was now risen in rebellion against him. And not only his throne, not only David's throne, but his very life was now in danger, probably together with the lives of his wives and their children. And by this time, Solomon was probably only about 10 years old. So what does the king do? He does nothing. He doesn't do anything. There was no calling of a council. No effort to make provision, to make a stand in Jerusalem, to stand against Absalom. No, de no determination to stand this, what we would think is rightful ground, and to resist this lawless son of his. Verse 14 of our text, 2 Samuel 15, says, And David said unto all his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for we shall not else escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. So now at last the blow, the blow comes, the, the rebellion, full-blown rebellion comes, and David seems to passively allow what he evidently felt to be God's chastisement, God's deserved chastisement upon him. His decision to take flight seems to be immediate. We don't read of any any uh, counsel with others about whether to stand and fight or what to do. His decision seems to be made to, to take flight right away. And it, it almost seems as if he's, he's cowardly here in his eagerness to escape. He's the great warrior, don't forget. The one with a tremendous reputation, not just within Israel, but outside its boundaries. as a great warrior. And here he is preparing, preparing to give up everything without so much as a struggle or a battle. It almost looks like a, a little bit of a wind and it, it's blowing him over at this point in time and toppling his kingship. It may well be that David felt that this was God's just retribution upon him for earlier crimes that he had committed. Remember that uh, God had told him what was going to happen. And that's our second point. Our first point is that God is faithful our second point is that God always fulfills His Word, even to the smallest detail. Remember back in chapter 12, verse 11, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. Now there's two parts to this I want us to look at. The first part is, God uses people and circumstances to fulfill His Word. So first, let's dig into the scriptures a little bit. And I want to find the reason why there seemed to be a relationship between Ahithophel and Absalom. This man, Ahithophel, had been a trusted counselor, a trusted advisor of David's for some time. But Absalom looked to Ahithophel right away for support. Why? See, I, I believe that everything, and I've said this before, I believe that everything is in scripture for a reason. Sometimes we, we gloss over details and, and uh, we go through stories and we don't see little things. But if we take time to look at even the little details, whole stories can often make a whole lot more sense to us. So let's find out some more about Ahithophel. Verse 12 says, Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor. He's described here as David's counselor. And he sent for him from his city even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. 
it would sound as if perhaps Ahithophel was kind of in semi-retirement or something, and at least at this time he was back in his own city. It goes on to say, and the consp conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. So it, the numbers are gaining and growing that are supporting Absalom, and he reaches out to Ahithophel and wants his support. And the next verse says, And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. Now, I want us to look at a verse in the next chapter to tell us of the impact of Ahithophel upon the people. What impact did this man have? What sway did he have in this, this rebellion? Chapter 16, verse 23 says the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. People respected Ahithophel's counsel greatly. They thought it seemed like his counsel was as if he spoke from the very words of God. So there's no doubt that he was a prime mover in this rebellion. He at least played the part of turning that rebellion into something from, from something smaller with some support of Absalom to something greater with a growing support that Scripture says it was getting. In 2 Samuel 23, reaching ahead further, we are given the names of 37 men who, who formed the special bodyguard of David in an earlier day. Among them was a man named Eliam, the son of Ahithophel. Now go back to the story of David's fall, and we read this in chapter 11. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Uriah married the daughter of Eliam, the son of Ahithophel. So you follow me? I don't want to lose you here, but what it, uh, what it comes down to is Bathsheba, whom David so mistreated, was Ahithophel's granddaughter. And there's the connection. And Uriah, the soldier that David had murdered, was married to Ahithophel's granddaughter. So no wonder we read in the psalm that was written at this time, Psalm 41 is one of the ones written at this time, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, had lift, hath lifted up his heel against me. Of course, we look at that verse, and it's prophetic of our Lord and his betrayal by Judas, who ate with him. But here for David it's fulfilled as well. His friend, his trusted counselor, Ahithophel, lifts up his heel against David. And he does so because he hasn't gotten over the fact that David mistreated his granddaughter and her husband. 2 Samuel 15, 12, Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gilo. It would seem Ahithophel was probably still brooding over the grievous wrongs that had been done to his household. No doubt Absalom knew all this, and therefore he could approach Ahithophel confident of his support and knowing the influence that Ahithophel would add to Absalom's goals. Now we go to a verse written by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians, and of course this could be addressed to Ahithophel, as wrong as David's actions were, and as wrong as actions and words that might be done against you and I at times, these words apply for us. Ephesians 4.31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So maybe this also explains then why David did not resist. Trouble was coming from his own household, just as Nathan had said from the Lord that it would. To withstand Absalom may have appeared to David to be fighting against God's very judgment that he felt was deserving upon him. So the first thing we said about this was that God uses people and circumstances to fulfill his word. But now I want us to look at, at this, and what, and what goes beyond that even. 2 Samuel 15, 16 says, And the king went forth, 
and all his household after him. And the king left ten women, which were concubines, to keep the house. Now, I'm sure you know that concubines were sort of like second-class wives. Uh, but they were wives or concubines of David's. So David's object in leaving them behind, it says, was to keep the house. But God's design was to make good upon his word. Remember back in chapter 12, verse 11, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, God speaking to David, say, you did your thing secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the Son. So now go ahead a little bit into chapter 16, and verse 22 says, So they spread Absalom a tent upon the top of the house, and Absalom went in unto his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. And of course it said in the, under the sun as well, and it's a, it's a tent on top of the house. So God's word is fulfilled to the smallest detail. God had said that David's trouble was going to come from David's house, and he said his wives, uh, David had done his thing secretly, but his wives, he was going to have someone else take them, and it was going to be done in the full sight of everyone and under the, under the sun. And exactly what happens in that next chapter. God's word that David's wives would lie with another was fulfilled. As far as David knew, this was a voluntary act in leaving these ten concubines behind to keep the house. Uh, but in the all-knowingness of God, the omniscience of our God, he was perhaps divinely constrained that God's word would be accomplished and fulfilled. Now previously we have seen David suffering wrongfully as a martyr, just about. You know, when he's being chased around by Saul, and he took it graciously. Now we see him suffering for wrongdoing as a penitent, as somebody who's deserving of the punishment and been told he's gonna, going to receive it. And again, he seems to be taking it graciously. Now this brings us to our third point. Remember our first point was that God is faithful. Our second point was that God fulfills his word, and it's interesting how he works it out, and it was fulfilled. The third thing is, be sure that your sin will, the scripture says, be sure your sin will find you out. Well, we can be sure here that your sin is going to follow you. This is several years later before the fulfillment of Solomon. And Numbers 32, 23 is where we have that phrase, be sure your sin will find you out. How dearly David has paid for his sins. Consequences must be paid for sin. And that is something that I think we fail to understand in our day and age. Uh, we seem to think sometimes we can sin with impunity and then simply come back and repent and it's all said and done. Not the case. Consequences must be paid for sin. Even though, like David, forgiveness is granted. Back in chapter 12, verse 13, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. In other words, you're forgiven. Thou shalt not die. Do you remember where sin began? Where sin begins? In chapter 12, verse 9, Nathan confronts David and says to him, Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord? to do evil in his sight. Where sin begins. How crucial it is for us to obey the law of God. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Psalm 119, 4. Verse 6 says of Psalm 119, Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Here we have David Ashamed of what he has done, ashamed of the depths to which he plummeted some years back, ashamed of that. And he says later, then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. And of course, the verse in between these last two that I read says, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. What a plea from David. 
As I said at the beginning, like David, changes in our circumstances often afford us an opportunity to see God's graces work in our, in our, our lives. There are some fruit of the Spirit that uh, can only become evident in our life or are only brought to fruition in our lives when we suffer trials and tribulations and difficulties. But there's even more that trials reveal as we learn from David. And that is our, our fourth point. True friends are forever. They're there not just in good times, they're there in tough times. And while this revolt seemed to reveal how David subjected himself to what he believed to be the will of God, it also showed clearly who those were who were for him and who were against him. Verse 15 in our text chapter, chapter 15, says, And the king's servants said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever my lord the king shall appoint. Oftentimes it is in trials and tribulations that we likewise discover who our real friends are. And so again it brings us to, to that point that we stressed in the last couple of lectures, the importance of who you keep company with. And again it brings out those those verses we've, we've talked about before, and I, Psalm 119, verse 63, and verse 115, uh, Proverbs 13, 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. But if we add to that this time, Proverbs 17, 17, which says, A friend loveth at all times. A true friend. A friend loveth at all times. And of course, Proverbs 18, 24, being prophetic, says, There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Prophetic of our Lord. The last point we want to, we want to mention today, our fifth point, is that God uses foreshadowing to help us understand His Word. I want you to compare with me a couple different scriptures. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 6, it says, And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment, so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And verse, further down in verse 17, it says, And the king went forth, and all the people after him, and tarried in a place that was far off. And all his servants passed on beside him, and, and all the Cherethites, and all the Pelethites, and all the Gittites, 600 men which came after him from Gath, passed on before the king. Now that list of people who was passing on before him can, is, is a list of people who were not Israelites. So a little bit prophetic. Um, it sounds like in verse 6 that uh, all Israel were rebelling against their king. And many of those at least that were following David were not Israelites. There were others that were in the land, but they were going to stick with David and follow David. Now I said we, God uses foreshadowing. We can look at this and say that it's foreshadowing of the nation of Israel's rejection of the Savior. Well, the Gentiles, these non-Israelites that followed David, were foreshadowing of Gentiles that were not afraid to be Christ's followers. So let us look a quick review of what, uh, of what David has, has taught us today. God is faithful. That was our first point. God is faithful. Difficult times, tough times, if we will bend and surrender to Him, God will be there for us. He'll see us through. Secondly, God always fulfills His Word. Little details that we looked at this time. Little details that God, in ways that God does fulfill what His Word has said, even years earlier. Thirdly, we said, be sure your sins will follow you. Many years later, many years down the road, we see, we see this happening, something that Nathan from the Lord had told David would happen. Fourthly, we find that true friends are forever. True friends, true quality friends are forever. And we need to cultivate those kind of friendships. And be careful again who we call friends, who we hang out with. And the last point we said was that God uses foreshadowing in His Word to help us understand. Again, I, make, I want to make the point to you that 
the Old Testament and these stories about David are not just stories to be read for entertainment. There is much to be learned here as it uh, assures us in 1 Corinthians 10.11 and Romans 15.4 that the scriptures that were written aforetime were written for our learning. So we need to learn, so we need to learn from this story of David, the different things that uh, are evident for us to be gained from them. Psalm 119, 18 says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things. Let it be so for you and I. Amen.